When I was in school, I absolutely hated writing. It wasn't until I was a bit older that I came to understand the power of words. If you're a business owner, you understand that power too. A business blog, when done right, can drive sales, increase revenue, and get you more customers. But as a business owner, you probably don't have the time to do all that writing. Plus, if you're not a copywriter by trade, you might feel like you're just kind of throwing words out there and they're not actually accomplishing anything. The good news is, there's a simple solution. Check it out. I call it the ultimate blog post checklist for businesses with online stores. This checklist will allow you to write better, more effective articles that convert readers into buyers. It's full of easy to follow examples to get your creativity flowing based on experience of nearly a million words written. And best of all, it's effective on any type of article in any industry or niche. I've successfully used this exact checklist on topics from pool table reviews to investment advice. Tired of spending tons of time writing stuff that doesn't convert? This checklist will change that by giving you highly effective blog posts and articles that transform readers into paying customers. Go to invicta.enterprises slash free checklist and start saving time and transforming your writing now. That's invicta.enterprises slash free checklist. Today we start a new Sherlock mystery, and I really like how this is getting into, I feel like we're, we're four bucks into the Sherlock Holmes adventures, and we're finally getting to the point where I think uh, Arthur Conan Doyle really started making these these characters feel personable and, and actually have more depth to them and stuff. So it's really cool to see that. Hope you guys enjoy it, and don't forget about the Sherlock contest. I'm giving away four free audiobooks to five lucky listeners, so if you want to get in on that, just check out the show notes down below or go to anotherworldaudiobooks.wordpress.com, and you can find all the details there for how, to, how you can uh, participate and have a chance to win those four free audiobooks. So without further ado, I give you the Rygate Squires. 7. The Rygate Squires It was some time before the health of my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, recovered from the strain caused by his immense exertions in the spring of 87. The whole question of the Netherlands Sumatra Company and of the colossal schemes of Baron Mouponti are too recent in the minds of the public and are too intimately concerned with politics and finance to be fitting subjects for this series of sketches. They led, however, in an indirect fashion to a singular and complex problem which gave my friend an opportunity of demonstrating the value of a fresh weapon among the many with which he waged his lifelong battle against crime. On referring to my notes, I see that it was upon the 14th of April that I received a telegram from Lyons, which informed me that Holmes was lying ill in the Hotel du Long. Within twenty-four hours I was in his sick-room, and was relieved to find that there was nothing formidable in his symptoms. Even his iron constitution, however, had broken down under the strain of an investigation which had extended over two months, during which period he had never worked less than fifteen hours a day, and had more than once, as he assured me, kept to his task for five days at a stretch. Even the triumphant issue of his labours could not save him from reaction after so terrible an exertion and at a time when Europe was ringing with his name, and when his room was literally ankle-deep with congratulatory telegrams, I found him a prey to the blackest depression. Even the knowledge that he had succeeded where the police and three countries had failed, and that he had outmaneuvered at every point the most accomplished swindler in Europe, was insufficient to rouse him from his nervous prostration. Three days later we were back in Baker Street together, but it was evident that my friend would be much the better for a change, and the thought of a week of springtime in the country was full of attractions to me also. My old friend, Colonel Hayter, who had come under my professional care in Afghanistan, had now taken a house near Rygate in Surrey, and had frequently asked me to come down to him upon a visit. On the last occasion he had remarked that, if my friend would only come with me, he would be glad to extend his hospitality to him also. A little diplomacy was needed, but when Holmes understood that the establishment was a bachelor one, and that he would be allowed the fullest freedom, he fell in with my plans, and a week after our return from Lyons we were under the colonel's roof. Hayter was a fine old soldier, who had seen much of the world, and he soon found, as I had expected, that Holmes and he had much in common. On the evening of our arrival we were sitting in the colonel's gun-room after dinner, Holmes stretched upon the sofa, while Hayter and I looked over his little armory of firearms. "'By the way,' he said suddenly, "'I think I'll take one of these pistols upstairs with me, in case we have an alarm.' "'An alarm?' said I. "'Yes, we've had a scare in this part lately. Old Acton, who's one of our county magnates, had his house broken into last Monday. No great damage done, but the fellows are still at large.' No clue, 
asked Holmes, cocking his eye at the colonel. Not as yet, but the affair is a pity one, one of our little country crimes, which must seem too small for your attention, Mr. Holmes, after this great international affair. Holmes waved away the compliment, though his smile showed that it had pleased him. Was there any feature of interest? I fancy not. The thieves ransacked the library and got very little for their pains. The whole place was turned upside down, drawers burst open and presses ransacked, with the results that an old volume of Pope's Homer, two-plated candlesticks, an ivory letterweight, a small oak barometer, and a ball of twine are all that had vanished. What an extraordinary assortment, I exclaimed. Well, oh, the fellows evidently grabbed hold of everything they could get. Holmes grunted from the sofa. The county police ought to make something of that, said he. Why, it is surely obvious that... But I held up a warning finger. You are here to rest, my dear fellow. For heaven's sake, don't get started on a new problem when your nerves are all in shreds. Holmes shrugged his shoulders with a glance of comic resignation towards the colonel, and the talk drifted away into less dangerous channels. It was destined, however, that all my professional caution should be wasted, for next morning the problem obtruded itself upon us in such a way that it was impossible to ignore it, and our country visit took a turn which neither of us could have anticipated. We were at breakfast when the colonel's butler rushed in with all his propriety shaken out of him. "'Have you heard the news, sir?' he gasped. "'At the Cunningham, sir!' "'Burglary!' cried the colonel, with his coffee cup in mid-air. Murder! The colonel whistled. By Jove! said he. Who's killed then? The J.P. or his son? Neither, sir. It was William, the coachman, shot through the heart, sir, and never spoke again. Who shot him then? The burglar, sir. He was off like a shot and got clean away. He just broke in at the pantry window when William came on him and met his end in saving his master's property. What time? It was last night, sir. Somewhere about twelve. Ah, then we'll step over afterwards, said the colonel, coolly settling down to his breakfast again. It's a baddish business, he added when the butler had gone. He's our leading man about here, his old Cunningham, and a very decent fellow, too. He'll be cut up over this, for the man has been in his service for years and was a good servant. It's evidently the same villains who broke into actions. And stole that very singular collection, said Holmes thoughtfully. Precisely. Hmm. It may prove the simplest matter in the world, but all the same at first glance— this is just a little curious, is it not? A gang of burglars acting in the country might be expected to vary the scene of their operations, and not to crack two cribs in the same district within a few days. When you spoke last night of taking precautions, I remember that it passed through my mind that this was probably the last parish in England to which the thief or thieves would be likely to turn their attentions, which shows that I still have much to learn. I fancy it's some local practitioner, said the colonel. In that case, of course, Actons and Cunninghams are just the places he would go for, since they are far the largest about here. And richest? Well, they ought to be, but they've had a lawsuit for some years which has sucked the blood out of both of them, I fancy. Old Acton had some claim on behalf of Cunningham's estate, and the lawyers have been at it with both hands. If it's a local villain, there should not be much difficulty in running him down, said Holmes with a yawn. All right, Watson, I don't intend to meddle. Inspector Forrester, sir, said the butler, throwing open the door. The official, a smart, keen-faced young fellow, stepped into the room. Good morning, Colonel, said he. I hope I don't intrude, but we hear that Mr. Holmes of Baker Street is here. The colonel waved his hand towards my friend, and the inspector bowed. We thought that perhaps you would care to step across, Mr. Holmes. The fates are against you, Watson, said he, laughing. We were chatting about the matter when you came in, Inspector. Perhaps you can let us have a few details. 
As he leaned back in his chair in that familiar attitude, I knew that the case was hopeless. We had no clue in the acting affair, but here we have plenty to go on, and there's no doubt it is the same party in each case. The man was seen. Ah. Yes, sir, uh, but he was off like a deer after the shot that killed poor William Kerwin was fired. Mr. Cunningham saw him from the bedroom window, and Mr. Alec Cunningham saw him from the back passage. It was quarter to twelve when the alarm broke out. Mr. Cunningham had just got into bed, and Mr. Alec was smoking a pipe in his dressing gown. They both heard William the coachman calling for help, and Mr. Alec ran down to see what was the matter. The back door was open, and he came to the foot of the stairs. He saw two men wrestling together outside. One of them fired a shot, the other dropped, and the murderer rushed across the garden and over the hedge. Uh, Mr. Cunningham, looking out of his bedroom, saw the fellow as he gained the road, but lost sight of him at once. Mr. Alex stopped to see if he could help the dying man, and so the villain got clean away. Uh, Beyond the fact that he was a middle-sized man and dressed in some dark stuff, we have no personal clue, but we are making energetic inquiries, and if he is a stranger, we shall soon find him out. What was this William doing there? Did he say anything before he died? Not a word. He lives at the lodge with his mother, and as he is a very faithful fellow, we imagine that he walked up to the house with the intention of seeing that all was right there. Of course, this acting business has put everyone on their guard. The robber must have just burst open the door. The lock had been forced when William came upon him. Did William say anything to his mother before going out? She is very old and deaf, and we can get no information from her. The shock has made her half-witted, but I understand that she was never very bright. There is one very important circumstance, however. Look at this. He took a small piece of torn paper from a notebook and spread it out upon his knee. This was found between the finger and thumb of the dead man. It appears to be a fragment torn from a larger sheet. You will observe that the hour mentioned upon it is the very time at which the poor fellow met his fate. You see that his murderer might have torn the rest of the sheet from him, or he might have taken this fragment from the murderer. It reads almost as though it were an appointment. Holmes took the scrap of paper, a facsimile of which is reproduced here. The parts that were visible read, At quarter to twelve, learn what may be. Presuming that it is an appointment, continued the inspector. It is, of course, a conceivable theory that this William Kerwin, though he had the reputation of being an honest man, may have been in league with the thief. He may have met him there, may even have helped him to break in the door, and they may have fallen out between themselves. This writing is of extraordinary interest, said Holmes, who had been examining it with intense concentration. These are much deeper waters than I had thought. He sank his head upon his hands, while the inspector smiled at the effect which this case had upon the famous London specialist. "'Your last remark,' said Holmes presently, "'as to the possibility of there being an understanding between the burglar and the servant, and this being a note of appointment from one to the other, is an ingenious and not entirely impossible supposition. But this writing opens up.' He sank his head into his hands again, and remained for some minutes in the deepest thought. When he raised his face again, I was surprised to see that his cheeks were tinged with colour, and his eyes as bright as before his illness. He sprang to his feet with all his old energy. "'I'll tell you what,' said he. "'I should like to have a quiet little glance into the details of this case. There is something in it which fascinates me extremely. If you will permit me, Colonel, I will leave my friend Watson and you, and I will step round with the inspector to test the truth of one or two little fancies of mine. I will be with you again in half an hour. An hour and a half had elapsed before the inspector returned alone. Mr. Holmes is walking up and down in the field outside, said he. He wants us all four to go up to the house together. To Mr. Cunningham's? Yes, sir. What for? The inspector shrugged his shoulders. I don't quite know, sir. Between ourselves, I think Mr. Holmes had not quite got over his illness yet. He's been behaving very queerly, and he is very much excited. I don't think you need to alarm yourself, said I. I have usually found that there was a method in his madness. Some folks might say there was madness in his method, muttered the inspector. 
but he's all fired at start, Colonel, so we had best go out if you're ready. We found Holmes pacing up and down in the field, his chin sunk upon his breast, and his hands thrust into his trouser pockets. The matter grows in interest, said he. Watson, your country trip has been a distinct success. I have had a charming morning. You have been up to the scene of the crime, I understand, said the colonel. Yes, the inspector and I have made quite a little reconnaissance together. Any success? Well, we have seen some very interesting things. I'll tell you what we did as we walk. First of all, we saw the body of this unfortunate man. He certainly died from a revolver wound, as reported. Had you doubted it, then? Oh, it is as well to test everything. Our inspection was not wasted. We then had an interview with Mr. Cunningham and his son, who were able to point out the exact spot where the murderer had broken through the garden hedge in his flight. That was of great interest. Naturally. Then we had a look at this poor fellow's mother. We could get no information from her, however, as she is very old and feeble. And what is the result of your investigations? The conviction that the crime is a very peculiar one. Perhaps our visit now may do something to make it less obscure. I think that we are both agreed, Inspector, that the fragment of paper in the dead man's hand, bearing as it does the very hour of his death written upon it, is of extreme importance. It should give a clue, Mr. Holmes. It does give a clue. Whoever wrote that note was the man who brought William Kerwin out of his bed at that hour. But where is the rest of that sheet of paper? I examine the ground carefully in hope of finding it, said the inspector. It was torn out of the dead man's hand. Why was someone so anxious to get possession of it? Because it incriminated him. And what would he do with it? Thrust it into his pocket, most likely, never noticing that a corner of it had been left in the grip of the corpse. If we could get the rest of that sheet, it is obvious that we should have gone a long way towards solving the mystery. Yes, but how can we get out of the criminal's pocket before we catch the criminal? Well, well, it was worth thinking over. Then there is another obvious point. The note was sent to William. The man who wrote it could not have taken it. Otherwise, of course, he might have delivered his own message by word of mouth. Who brought the note, then? Or did it come through the post? I have made inquiries, said the inspector. William received a letter by the afternoon post yesterday. The envelope was destroyed by him. Excellent, cried Holmes, clapping the inspector on the back. You've seen the postman. It is a pleasure to work with you. Well... Here is the lodge, and if you will come up, Colonel, I will show you the scene of the crime. We passed the pretty cottage where the murdered man had lived, and walked up an oak-lined avenue to the fine old Queen Anne house, which bears the date of Malplaquet upon the lintel of the door. Holmes and the inspector led us round it until we came to the side gate, which is separated by a stretch of garden from the hedge which lines the road. A constable was standing at the kitchen door. Throw the door open, officer, said Holmes. Now, it was on those stairs that young Mr. Cunningham stood and saw the two men struggling just where we are. Old Mr. Cunningham was at that window, the second one on the left, and he saw the fellow get away just to the left of that bush. Then Mr. Alec ran out and knelt beside the wounded man. The ground is very hard, you see, and there are no marks to guide us. As he spoke, two men came down the garden path from round the angle of the house. The one was an elderly man with a strong, deep-lined, heavy-eyed face, the other a dashing young fellow whose bright, smiling expression and showy dress were in strange contrast with the business which had brought us here. "'Still at it, then?' said he to Holmes. "'I thought you Londoners were never at fault. You don't seem to be so very quick after all.' "'Ah, you must give us a little time said Holmes good-humouredly. "'You're wanted,' said young Alec Cunningham. "'Why, I don't see that we have any clue at all.' "'There is only one,' answered the inspector. "'We thought that if we could only find—' "'Good heavens, Mr. Holmes, what is the matter?' My poor friend's face had suddenly assumed the most dreadful expression. His eyes rolled upwards, his features writhed in agony, and with a suppressed groan he dropped on his face upon the ground.' 
Horrified at the suddenness and severity of the attack, we carried him into the kitchen, where he lay back in a large chair and breathed heavily for some minutes. Finally, with a shamefaced apology for his weakness, he rose once more. "'Watson would tell you that I have only just recovered from a severe illness,' he explained. "'I am liable to these sudden nervous attacks.' "'Shall I send you home in my trap?' asked old Cunningham. "'Well, since I am here, there is one point on which I should like to feel sure. We can very easily verify it.' "'What was it?' It seems to me that it is just possible that the arrival of this poor fellow William was not before, but after, the entrance of the burglar into the house. You appear to take it for granted that, although the door was forced, the robber never got in. I fancy that is quite obvious, said Mr. Cunningham gravely. Why, my son Alec had not yet gone to bed, and he would certainly have heard anyone moving about. Where was he sitting? I was smoking in my dressing room. Which window is that? The last one on the left, next to my father's. Both of your lamps were lit, of course? Undoubtedly. There are some very singular points here, said Holmes, smiling. Is it not extraordinary that a burglar, and a burglar who had some previous experience, should deliberately break into a house at a time when he could see from the lights that two of the family were still afoot? He must have been a cool hand. Well, of course. If the case were not an odd one, we should not have been driven to ask you for an explanation, said young Mr. Alec. But as your idea is that the man had robbed the house before William tackled him, I think it a most absurd notion. Wouldn't we have found the place disarranged and missed the things which he had taken? It depends on what the things were, said Holmes. You must remember that we are dealing with a burglar who is a very peculiar fellow, and who appears to work on lines of his own. Look, for example, at the queer lot of things which he took from Acton's. What was it? A ball of string, a letter weight, and I don't know what other odds and ends. Well, we are quite in your hands, Mr. Holmes, said old Cunningham. Anything which you or the inspector may suggest will most certainly be done. And once again, dropping you off on a little cliffhanger. Remember, if you want to have longer episodes where I could maybe fit in a whole adventure or more chapters per week, the best way to make that happen is to, to go to anchor.fm slash anotherworldaudiobooks and just click on support this podcast. Uh, this is, like I've said a, a bunch of times before, just a labor of love. I'm just doing it because I enjoy doing it. And I, I love helping other people be able to experience these stories and stuff. But if you want to help support the podcast and keep me going, that is the best way to do it. And other other than that is just to tell other people about the podcast and right now you can tell other people about the podcast while getting entered for a chance to win four free audiobooks which is a pretty good deal to, if, you, if you ask me you get to tell people about the podcast spread the word I mean, it's free you might as well might as well tell people that would enjoy it and then and uh, as a thank you for doing that you will get entered into the drawing and five people are going to win those four free audiobooks so make sure to check all that information down out down in the show notes below or at anotherworldaudiobooks.com wordpress.com all right guys we'll talk to you next week